I'd like to call this joint meeting to order for the town. Okay, um, and it is five o'clock on Wednesday, the 24th of April. I'd like to call this meeting of the village trustees to order. The first item on the agenda is additions and deletions from the agenda. Are there any additions or deletions? No. no? Oh. Okay. Uh, next item on the agenda is comments. citizen comments. Um, because we have a limited time again tonight, um, we're going to limit that to 10 minutes total. So, and we'll go back and forth between in the room and on Zoom. So, of outside of yeah. agenda items. Yes. Yes, outside of agenda yeah. items. I'm sorry. Thank you. Yeah. So, are there any citizen comments outside of the items on the agenda? Okay. Then let's move on. Uh, the trustees have a piece of. Um, as but have an agenda item. It's a sidewalk permit um, from Alex. Alex, can you come on up? Is our microphone up there for me? Yeah. Okay. Um, and so just tell us uh, about your application. Yeah, so the application is for us to um, grill in front of the shop on Elm Street. Um, as noted in the application, sort of from the driveway to uh, Gillingham's and the tree, uh, it's exactly as we did last year. Um, and um, the um, the general idea is to um, feature some Vermont products, our products, um, have a really nice sort of environment um, and fun scene out there. As I think um, we did last year um and um we that the timing i want uh, and i tried to keep it as open as possible on the application um we we really enjoyed it i think the community and our visitors really enjoyed it from from what i heard um if, if people heard otherwise I'd, i'm happy to take any feedback um we um want to be as fluid as we can with it, you know, there are, we did it last week on, last year on Thursdays and Eric and I sort of had some communication if the weather wasn't good or I wasn't able to do it or um, we wanted to roll out on Tuesday. We just wanted it to sort of be as fluid as we can so that the dates are purposely pretty open-ended. Um, happy to work out something where there's 24 hour notice or whatever that may be. Um, uh, you know, we we're happy to do it more than once a week um, if that's, doable on our end. Um, uh, we did do it, I think, through foliage. We did um, also grill on some Sundays and Mondays during foliage as well, which we'd like to do. I'm not sure just during foliage, but we'd like to do again this year. Uh, I don't know how many of those Sundays and Mondays. I don't know which ones, um, but it's certainly our intention to, to do that as well. Thank you. And so it looks like, and we already had your COI, so that was all taken care of, right? Except from the last time. Um, it looks like the, you've got plenty of sidewalk space open. Trustees, do you have questions? Um, yeah, I, I just want to, well, first of all, say that I think it's great that you're doing it again, Alice. It's good for the community. And I really stress what you know I'm about to say. <laughs> Sundays and Mondays as much as possible, just because that's where strong need is. But I, I understand. And you might consider when you know you're going to be doing it, and the weather looks good the next day, put it up on the list, sir, so we can know. Yeah, we do. Yeah, it's a good idea. Great. Trustees. The only concern for I think that last time was yeah. the not knowing what day it was going to be. So I think Alex talked about you know, being more fluid that the trustees are okay with that. Yeah, I think my only concern with it is just as we, and I know the EDC is working on some things, we're going to have the conversation about, you know, we have food during foliage again, that sort of thing. So we we'd like to be able to plan. So if you can, you know, give us a week heads up. So as we are, you know, if we do something similar to last year where we had people sitting out on the green, like we don't want to cannibalize each other. So if it's yes. like, there's thank you, know, you two people already selling hot dogs and hamburgers out on the green, like let's just keep the communication open. That's, Absolutely. So if you don't think that you can have a set schedule. Yeah, let me clarify that. So last last year we did 
Thursdays was the date, and, it, and it's, it's helpful for everybody to be programmatic. You know, we have to plan from our end in terms of what we're making or preparing, and it's just helpful for the community, everybody, to know that it's going to be a day. Um, so we'll likely do something similar. I don't know whether it's going to be Thursdays, but we'll say, hey, you know, every Wednesday from this date to this date, weather dependent, we plan to be outside grilling. We may add a date. It may rain. You know, who knows? Um, but to the point of Sundays and Mondays going closer to foliage, um, you know, at some point in, in August or early September, I'll try and pin down, you know, which Sundays and Mondays we're able to do, and that way you all can plan the course. Okay, so the plan is generally once a week. And yeah. Less weather, that sort of thing. Yeah, once once or twice a week, but at least one set day. And, you know, if it's a beautiful Tuesday coming up and, um, you know, we feels like a good day to be out there, um, you know, we'd like to be able to maybe just send a note. I don't know if, if it's Eric again or just send a note and say, hey, you know, 24 hours notice, we plan to come out and, and cook on those days. Brenda, did you have anything? No. Since you're on the other end. You all have enough information to vote. Yeah. Um, yeah. Are there any citizen comments? I have one. Yeah. Um, Both are there. <laughs> the trash barrel always is chock full every time I walk by. Can you do something about that? I know the town picks them up, but I can't. It's not my. I don't have any space to put a trash barrel. It's not my. I, I think. Um, I understand it generates trash. We talked about this in terms of, you know, upping the uh, pickup days, but it's it's uh, not not a responsibility of mine necessarily, and I don't think of other businesses to regulate that. Uh, I take care of my own trash. You know, I pay Casella a lot of money to do that. Okay. Yeah. Any other social comments? Fine. No? Okay. Um, then I would make a motion to approve um, the village butchers application to grill on the sidewalk um, is Tuesday once or twice a week, weather dependent. Um, is there a second? Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Great. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Alex. Alex. Thanks, Alex. All right. On the Pound agenda is the EDC marketing proposal. John Spector. So um, the uh, EDC is recommending that um, that another grant for uh, Jess Kirby to run our marketing program this year as a result of a series of discussions. Class four, the other applicant, um, withdrew their application. We voted unanimously then for Jess. Uh, I think to be fair, people, we, you know, we were split previously, but I think everyone felt that both firms were capable. Um, so we're recommending Jess Kirby. It's a one-year contract. It's for 50. It, 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 this is the first time this has ever happened. Contract accidentally overstated the cost by two thousand dollars. So it says fifty-four thousand two hundred and forty. What we're actually requesting is fifty-two thousand two hundred and forty. Um, there was a, a double counting. It's for a one-year contract, the three specific outcomes. So this year we are, and in all future years, we will be specific about the outcomes that we want. Uh, and this year we are designing a program to deliver 25 qualified leads to, to our school system that has an enormous positive financial impact to Woodstock um, to develop and maintain a much better information channel to educate both visitors and residents about uh, what events are taking place, what restaurants are open, where you can find restrooms, all of the questions that visitors would ask, and particularly around events, all the things that residents want to know as well. And in our kind of traditional pursuit of marketing Woodstock, rather than just saying marketing Woodstock, we are trying to achieve an objective of an increase of 5% in overall retail sales, but not during the peak period. What the proposal was was for, was for that 5% increase in May and June of 2024. We may shift that to May and June or April and May of 2025 because we're starting late. It took us longer than we thought. But two months that are not peak periods. So the marketing program will market Woodstock with, with a specific objective of non-peak growth. Um, the trend, So this the amount of the 
grant, $52,240, is just about a teeny bit more than half of what it was last year, and it's about a third of what we were spending two or three years ago. So it's been reduced um, significantly. Uh, we've had a successful transition from class four. It's been very professional. They have um, handed over all of the assets that can be extracted. We do lose some assets in the transition process. That's all was all made very clear in the in the meetings when we were evaluating the two proposals. But um, and those assets weren't could not they're not physically it's not possible to extract them from their system. <laughs> they're not extract they're built in. Um, so they've given us everything that they can give. It was a very professional handoff and we're ready to proceed with the new contract which would start now basically tomorrow actually if if you approve it i think that's it questions i'd make a motion for the select board to approve i second favor aye all right okay great thanks thank eric you. i think we'll bring you the contract you have a copy Next, we're moving on to our of short term rentals. Eric, do you have a couple of slides? Yeah, Nikki, could you uh, let me share my screen? You should be good. Thank you. So I just put some of the other quickly to kind of summarize where we were from last week, uh, where we kind of have to go um, today. Um, happy to make adjustments, but I feel we could kind of frame the conversation as a whole uh, before we hop in. Um, so last meeting on the 17th, uh, the joint boards got together to discuss the Planning Commission's potential uh, short-term rental uh, ordinance. Uh, by the end of the meeting, um, I feel like there was some agreement on a few things. One was that a new ordinance was needed. Um, there was mostly consensus around a cap of 52 for both owner-occupied and non-owner-occupied. Um, there was 55, sorry. Um, there was little to no disagreement on, on most of the other points of the ordinance. Um, and we ended up with um, still some back and forth on what the fees could look like. Um, so with that, we put together kind of a little agenda. Um, one is to have public comment like last week for 10 minutes uh, to see if anyone has any new information, new questions they had. Um, Next was a discussion is looking at the current ordinance as put together, are both boards okay with how it's put together besides the fee, fee schedule? Um, and if that is a yes, then we move on to kind of having a bigger discussion about the fees. Uh, one of the things that came up in discussion with the chairs over the last week was when we're talking about fees, I think it's very easy to get down in the weeds on what the fees are actually gonna be, what that money is gonna be, how it's gonna be used for. And we would reframe it in the sense of, we can't guarantee any such fee that'll come in. We don't know how many people will sign up, if it'll be 55, 55. If it is 55, 55, we can't guarantee how many rooms each person has. Um, so one of the things was like, could we kind of come up with a range of what the fees should be, and then work within that range and kind of break down how the fees should be set up. Uh, the Planning Commission is recommending a baseline of $145,000 as what they think is the bare minimum to put this program in place and then run it successfully. Um, so that's kind of a point of conversation we should have. Um, I quickly put together a range of fees that I'm not held to, but kind of to give us a sense of what it could look like. Um, you know, you go from like zero to $100,000 uh, $100,000 to 175, 175 to 250, 250 to uh, 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 beyond that. Um, just to kind of conceptualize what we're actually talking about and how it will look like, uh, with the assumption of if we fall within that range, you know, we should be okay both legally and also able to fund the program. Um, after that point, a lot of time left to talk about what fees will actually look like. Uh, I put together an Excel sheet so we can actually kind of play around 
with what the fee schedule would look like and what those fees would actually end up being. Um, and then as we get closer to 730, uh, where there is another scheduled meeting, talking about what, come, what will come next, um, if the boards can get to a point where we're comfortable with a fee schedule um, and everything else, we can plan a vote on a new ordinance for next week, uh, which would meet the Planning Commission's uh, timeline of having this in place by July 1. Uh, if we get to 730 tonight and we're still kind of far off on numerous things, I think conversation has to happen then of what the next step is. Do we try to meet three or four times the next week and try to meet the the, the timeline of July 1st, or do we take a step back and say we may need some more time to look into this, talk to the planning commission, and see what would happen if we go beyond the July 1 deadline. Um, so that's kind of how I put together the agenda for now. Um, before we pop into um, public comment, um, what I have on the screen, and let me make this a little bigger for everyone to see, um, is kind of a few different, so I'll make this bigger when we go over it, but it has the cap, it has what the permanent fee could be, it could have then what the oxy rate would be, and then what that revenue would come out to. So you see kind of what the Planning Commission originally recommended is that one. Uh, scenario one is something the select board uh, brought up in one of the conversations. Scenario two is another one. And then we kind of go through and talk about it. So you can actually see, as we're talking about the fees could be without actually generating revenue and what the difference would be, um, to kind of help everyone actually see what we're talking about instead of just throwing numbers out kind of into space and kind of not really having a real idea what, the, what that means. Um, so with that said, um, that's my little open and act. If we want to open up for public comment, happy to go from there. Is there anything to say about something that we haven't heard already on short-term rental? Please say your name and your residence. Hi, uh, my name is Andy Caffrey. We're at 15 The Green. We've owned the house for, I think, 20 years. And it's a part-time house. We've now been up here full-time for the last couple of years. Uh, I am very opposed to this. Um, my biggest concern is the unlimited rentals. I mean, currently, there is a, a, an ordinance in place that has all the enforcement mechanisms a new one will. $800 a day fines can be taken to the judicial branch to enforce it. So you're not gaining anything more with this. I mean, my first thought is who is driving this bus? What was the problem? You know, I'm not, I'm not sure. I haven't read anything in the paper about people having problem with short-term rentals. Um, and I, I have a sense that I feel bad for the planning board that has done all this work. And then at the last minute, people like me come in and start lobbing hand grenades and saying, oh, that's wrong, you should do that. But I think it's better to stop this than it is to just run with it because the planning board has put the work uh, the work in. Um, the fees are, are remarkable. I mean, it doesn't bother me. I guess my biggest concern is we have a house next door that is under the program and is permitted to do the short-term rentals. And when you break the, um, the groups down as the homesteaders or the non-homesteaders, the house next door is used by those people probably 75% of the year. 25%, if they can get a rental, they, they get a rental and to help with the taxes. And I think that's a huge portion of your non-homestead properties. There's this idea that there's, there's this, um, these LLCs out there that are snapping up homes for short-term rentals. Under the current system, they're not going to do that because if they're limited, you can't get a return on investment buying a house in Woodstock with the current uh, restrictions. You take those restrictions off and maybe you'll be encouraging the commercial uh, operator of the short-term rentals because they can do it year round. So, so that's our concern is that the house next door, which has worked fine, suddenly, you know, the fees, they're gonna rent it more and our neighborhood, our environment is gonna be changed. Um, the fees are frankly crazy. I mean, you're talking $30,000 for software. That's $300 per unit. You're talking $62,000 for a, a, a clerk, I believe, that's $600 a unit. It's 24 hours a week. What's a clerk going to do 24 hours a week managing this? And then you got $42,000 for legal fees, which is over $400 per unit. Has the town been incurring legal fees over STD, uh, STRs? Um, and then there's going to be all the excess. I mean, is that a tax or is it revenue? 
I mean, is it a tax or is it a fee? I think there's a real concern there. If you're raising $300,000 and creating this hundred, what, $50,000 a year uh, bureaucracy. Um, so I've also heard that you have enforcement issues, but the problem I'm hearing is that you're not enforcing what you currently have. Apparently there's, there's supposed to be a registry. I heard today that you don't have any idea how many short-term rentals you have. Can you finish up? We just want to make sure everybody else can see. Sure. Um, and I think that's that's crazy. And and there's zero compliance. There's an annual report they're supposed to file. Make them file it before you give them the next year's permit. So I think the current ordinance perhaps needs some amendments. Perhaps you raise the fees somewhat. Perhaps you put in some other things to that. But work with the current ordinance that you have, which is all you need. Don't start, don't create this huge bureaucracy. I think it's terrible overreach. Thank you. Oh, oh, oh the biggest problem, frankly, is your 14 day window. I suspect, and I don't know if anybody knows, but I suspect a lot of your short-term rental people probably don't rent for more than 14 days a year. It's, it's sort of a mom and pop sort of thing where they get a little money in to, to pay the taxes. And you're gonna allow people to rent up to 14 days without anything. If I was having one of these, then I was renting 20, you know, 20 days a year, I wouldn't get a permit. You're gonna encourage people to uh, cheat the system. Thanks. Thank you. Okay. And let us know your name, where you're from. And yeah, you're I'm Mary McQuaig, uh, South Woodstock. I own a farm out there. We have an old farmhouse. Um, to introduce myself, I used to be uh, on the zoning board way back um, and also uh, was involved in uh, town, making up a new town plan back in the 1980s. And I'm president of the Green Mountain Perkins Academy out in South Woodstock. And I know you've heard my story before, but I just wanted to uh, say, got to reiterate uh, a little bit. And I also want to say, I totally agree with uh, uh, the guy got it before me. Um, and he said it much better than I'm going to say it now. But um, uh, I just like to say that um, I hope this ordinance, this ordinance should be voted down. And um, what we have already, what, what's in place now. I don't believe it is an ordinance. Um, correct me if I, oh, I thought it was a regulation. It was, it was regulations. Is what we have now an ordinance in, the village? in place for short-term rentals? Sorry? Village is an ordinance in the town, it's a regulation. Okay, so regulation. Um, but I feel like what we have now is suffice. Um, and in short, I'll tell you why. Um, the, outra the fees are outrageous. The the faulty the the fee structure is faulty because it encourages um, what we don't want. We don't want you know like little mini hotels you know, and by having the fee set at a certain rate, um, you know people will continue to rent. It's it's mainly what's going on is these occasional not occasional but small time renters like myself. I do about 30 to 40 days a year. And there's many, many others, right? Many others that are like me. Um, we can't, it's not that easy for us to rent the year round, you know, whether because of the weather, uh, roads, heating systems, whatever. And um, and the other reason I, I feel that I discourage you, just, I would, think you should vote this down is because you are discouraging the hardworking community people that do this kind of thing. And I already have talked, I've talked to a lot of people in town and I, don't, I haven't talked to anybody that think this is a good idea. And a lot of the people that have short-term rentals or flirted with doing it are like, this is crazy. I'm not going to do this anymore. I'm mad at the town. I'm going to you know, do it in another town, or I'm going to move, or I'm going to sell my house. And um, so what you're doing is you're encouraging, uh, you know, encouraging the wrong thing. Um, Vermont is not a gated community or a town with empty estates. Vermont has character, and part of that character is our home businesses and our hospitality. Let Vermont continue to be the Vermont that we know and love. 
And this is coming from a community person. I grew up here. I love this town. I put a lot into this town. I volunteer. I do things. And, um, and that's all I got to say. Thank you. Okay, we've got about two and a half minutes left. Is there anyone else? Christina Martin, Woodstock, Vermont. I live at the end of two miles of Bumpy Dirt Road. I've been doing Airbnb for six years. I absolutely love it. I love hosting. I love encouraging people to come to Vermont and all the wonderful things that we do here. The quiet, the stars, I offer that up. I am an ambassador for you. I cannot afford the fee structure that you're proposing, partly because I can't write rent year round. The roads are such that you can't get in. Sometimes I can hardly get home. I There are times in the better months when I have to block out dates to fix my roof or replace a water pipe. I, I need time for that and time to go visit family. I can't be open 365 days a year and I can't raise my rates so high that some of the wonderful people that I get from Europe, from South America, from Canada, who come back here, who love it here. And part of it is because I do not have high rates. I have reasonable rates to encourage the good people that come to this town who love it. Some people are saying, we what, move here? Please don't make that an impossibility for me to afford or to continue to host with my heart. We've got about one minute left. Is there anybody on Zoom? We haven't had anybody. Okay. Okay. Um, all good points. And I just What's want to, sorry, Paula Townsend, resident, long-term rental provider. Um, everything I did catch that came in late was good points. I want to reiterate also just the that we are a tourism-driven state. We are a tourism-driven town. I don't want us to lose that. And um, people being able to do short-term rentals from their homes, they really are ambassadors to our community. And I appreciate them when I travel. And I don't want to restrict people from being able to provide that here in our town. Um, and I want you to think also about the numbers. I would love to see a structure. If you think there's between 180 and 200 currently in operation and you want to emphasize more for the owner occupied over the non-owner occupied and you think more than a hundred of those are non-owner occupied until you know all the numbers and you know what's sustainable and you know what is impactful let's say 200 100 owner occupied 100 non-owner occupied that's already going to reduce the non-owner occupied, assuming that there are some not in compliance yet who could get there. And it leaves a huge room for growth for the non-owner or for the owner occupied so that if our life circumstances change, we're not, not able to do this because it's capped at 50 and that's going to fill up. Thank you. Okay. Let's move on. Thank you, everybody who made a comment. Um, so, Eric, do you want to take the next part? This, this is Ray's okay. question for the point. Go ahead, Ray. Ray's question. <laughs> You're okay with that? Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, does any of the board have any comments about the uh, ordinances written except for the fees? I do. Um, and I'm sorry I missed the last meeting, so if I repeat something that was said, I was out of the country and not able to attend. Um, and I understand the purpose of the ordinance, and I, I think it's good that we're trying to um, pay for a system to increase enforcement and catch some of the non-registered short-term rentals. I think it's important that we have you know everybody complying with the same safety codes and fire codes. My concern is the owner-occupied short-term rentals in the R5 districts. Um, if you're not R5 right now, you're limited. If you are in the R5, you have not been limited as, as to how many times you rent. So what they're seeing is their fees escalating quite high 
without really any benefit. They're not getting um, what people in the non R5 districts are. They're not getting to increase the amount they rent because they've not had a limit. Uh, when I first moved here, this will certainly date me because there was no internet. And um, people used to register with the Chamber of Commerce if they had an extra bedroom that they were willing to rent during foliage. So when people would come for foliage and the inns were filled, they'd go to the Chamber of Commerce and they'd pay to live in some home. And I think a lot of like what Mary and others have expressed, a lot of the short term rentals in our rural areas are replicating that system and to ask them to um, rent more or increase their fees isn't within the spirit of what they're trying to do. So my major objection is fees for owner occupied in the R5 districts. I mean, I guess I'll respond to that. I think what we're trying to do is create a regulatory framework here. And I think that the previous policy, and this is my own, my own personal opinion, is bad policy. Um, it makes this ex exception for, for people who now expect expect exception um, and in doing so created a very unfair playing field um, for the majority of operators so while i see the unlimited not change those folks i still think that we should think about these fees being either paid for by the general taxpayer or paid for by the guests but not paid for by the operators um, and i think the same argument could be made inverse where the previous people were paying not a huge difference in fees and unable to rent at the same amount at the cost of one night, basically what it would cost. Um, and so we're bringing those people onto a level playing field by by the current, by any of the current fee structures that we have. But I'd really advise us not to keep making exceptions for certain zones or groups. I think that increases the time that we have to spend administering this program and enforcing it. Um, and and, you know, I'd be curious to know what other people's thoughts are. I think we need to have regulations and so forth in place with the pricing is crazy. Yeah, well, I think that's what we're yeah, tonight is the fees, the fees coming down. Right. That's the biggest complaint. Yeah, I agree. I agree with that. And I think that we really should um, take a look at um, that there are different types of rentals. There's seasonal rentals, and then there's, you know, full year rentals, and there's, um, you know, people that rent maybe two weeks. I think that we need to come up with different categories for different types of situations. And I also feel that um, we should not be charged per, if, 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 if my um, place says it, that I can, rent to four people that happens like maybe once a year probably not so i think it should be done like the sewer system does which is tax per bedroom not per how many people live in your home or how many you could possibly sleep so i think brenda's and greg's points are well taken but i think we want to talk about non-fees right now and then get to the fees after the fact um so just make, we kind of stay on the same path. I know we're going to, I think the fees will be the larger conversation, but we want to make sure we kind of get, see if everything else is in alignment before we spend the rest of the time on the fees. So I think the question was, from the, the, the board, correct me if I'm wrong, from the, from the chair, is if the suck would have issues outside of the fee structure on the ordinance. So I think Susan might have mentioned she had an issue with R5 and not an unlimited. So that's the point I taken. I that part of the question. Oh. Oh, no. no, it was one. Oh, oh, okay. I am still concerned about unlimited rentals per year. I, I know that enforcement has been impossible and will be difficult, um, but I, I do think that an unlimited number of rentals removes some of the levers that neighbors feel that they have. I think it changes the um, profile of a property as being appealing to a pure investor. Um, and since we're, I know we're not talking about fees, but if we are lowering the fees, I think that capping and maybe making up some difference in penalties if people are violating how many times per year they're allowed to do that.
I mean, I think if there's a way to enforce number of times rented, we wouldn't be having, we wouldn't be revisiting this policy. I think if anybody has suggestions on how that's implemented, I'm open to it, but the Planning Commission found no viable way to track and enforce how many times rented. As it is, we have very few people who, as Andy mentioned, are submitting annual reports as they're supposed to do every year, even though our permit process is not annual. So, um, and that is like a self proclamation. So I, I understand the need to balance the character. I'm just honestly unsure of, of how to meet that need without the cap. What is the um, software that we're investing to help with that? No. It tracks, so what the difference is between this ordinance is it also tracks advertisements as opposed to the regulation and the ordinance before, which tracked operation. So we are now finding if properties are advertised as well. This software tracks properties that are being advertised in our community. There's no software that has the capability to track how many times rented. I think that's a sticking point for me is I don't want to, I would be reticent to pass something that we can't enforce, but there's no, if there's, if there's not a way to enforce it, I would be reticent to pass to pass an ordinance on it. And I'm also reticent to, to start carving out any sort of exceptions um, for for blanket zones or, or groups, because again, it's one, I think one of the reasons that STRs was revisited was because it was so uneven. Um, and so to have one set of rules that are enforceable for everyone um, and that we know that we have the technology and the manpower to implement, to follow up on, I think we, we can't legislate something that we can't follow up on, that we can't maintain. If we can't maintain it, I'm not sure how we can have it. So Laura just said that the software cannot track how many times that a place is rented. <laughs> so it only tracks if somebody should buy into the system um, through Airbnb or whatever, register their place. So even if it's registered, let's say it was an old res registry, it wouldn't tell you if that particular um, a short term rental was in, in use. What do you mean? Sorry, can you rephrase the question? So, yes, I can. Um, so, what I'm saying is number one, how often, how, how updated yep. is the software that says like what rentals are out there? And then, if you have no idea that it's actually being used, then how can you actually enforce anything? Because it's the enforcement is based on advertising it. So if something is being advertised as a short-term rental without a permit, then it is is going to be fined. Does that make sense? Uh -huh. The software, is my understanding, and I, I can get the details from, from Ben and the Planning and Zoning Office, is that it scrubs about 80 sites that short-term rentals operate on and generates a report on a daily, if not more frequent basis to tell you what it's found. That then needs to be tracked against our permits, which is manual work to understand who is permitted and who is not. There are about, I think when Mary Margaret did this research on the Planning Commission last year, found more than 100 sites that short-term rentals can advertise on. That doesn't even include people who rent word of mouth or people that rent, you know, not on the internet. Again, it is probably near impossible to reach 100% compliance, but what we're looking for is what's significantly better than what we have now, which is with regulations and enforcement. So what happens if someone is renting word of mouth? What happens then? They could, uh, someone could issue a complaint with the planning and zoning office. Planning and zoning could send them a warning letter and they could, you know, choose to stop operating or not operating, but we really have like no control over what they do on property. I'd have to talk to Stephen on how the police enforce it. But you show up to somebody's property, they could just be like, you know, we're friends. Again, it's it's. <laughs> I mean, I think we. 
nothing's perfect. Yeah. You know, we can't stop everyone speeding right. in the town unless we hire a thousand police officers to be in every right. five feet. So we have to assume that for every, no matter what we do, people are going to work around some, some way. Mm -hmm. uh, when you guys can close public comment. Yeah. I mean, we should close public comment. So uh, I was uh, out of the country also for the last meeting. And I, what was the feeling about the 55 and 55, everybody here? Was that? We were all pretty content on it. All pretty yeah. content with those are the right numbers. Mm -hmm. But there's also a number that we had to increase. It, we, okay. Just yeah. not bar changing. Yeah. So the 55 55 is a recommendation from the Planning Commission. Um, as a board, you have the ability to adjust that as you see fit. Um, but that's the recommendation from the Planning Commission based on the 5% of housing uh, number that they have. And so in the future, if we adopt this as one ordinance for both municipalities, um, we would have to all be in agreement. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a majority, yeah. What, I, correct me if I'm wrong, but don't we have a, a higher number of non-owner occupied res short-term rentals registered right now, so there's not as much room to bring in new non-owner. Right, so yeah, I'm aware of that. Uh, we're not going to be really increasing how many we have. So we, legally. okay, so there's plenty of room to increase owner operators. From the information the Planning Commission was able to find, yes, that's correct, that there's about 25-ish <laughs> unoccupied. And so you're that well, those states are 30 new ones while you're hopefully decreasing law uh, unknown occupied and encourage them to maybe turn to a long term rental something else. Yeah. And what about the number of days that you're allowed to do? So this new ordinance that the planning commission is recommended is unlimited. Yeah. yeah. But isn't there some sh shorter number that you can do without it's not at all? 14 days. 14, 14, it's 14 yeah. days. Right. That's what and standard and common it's when the meals lodging and alcohol tax kicks in the one percent meals and lodging tax kicks in after 14 days so like everyone who's a short-term rental operator who's been renting more than 15 days already collects that and we miss that to the state department of taxes it's also the definition that's consistent with the department of department of health and human services and it's consistent with most of the state legislature and other towns that we looked at 14 days and less than so if you rent 14 over, days and less than 30, some towns do more than 14 days. No. So like if you rent, sorry, the definition being that if you rent for longer than 30 days at a time, that is not considered a short term. No, I know that. Yeah. yeah. If you rent, if you rent less than 14 days total in the year, that is not considered a short term rental or a commercial use. I think the common that would send us who pays who who deals that, but they won't. <laughs> so, uh, R5 uh, unlimited rentals came up. Uh, are there other non fee issues that you want to have? Even ones that are not selling in the I'm kind of, I guess we get abatements, but I don't know how that works in if that's part of the fee structure or um, now, Eric. And there is a current abatement in there. There's a current waiver in there for legal, non conforming, pre existing rural operators. So folks that meet the criteria who were um, pre existing to the previous ordinance, if they're able to prove that we're existing to the previous ordinance, they're eligible for a waiver with the current fee structure for up to $2,000. Um, but obviously, if we lower the fees, then we would need to recalibrate that cost. Um, there's also something we talked about last week, which could be a lever if we're looking to limit the number of times folks can, which would be, and this is something I would suggest doing across the board for owner-occupied and non-owner-occupied, which could be a fee abatement if folks make up to a certain amount or less of in a certain amount or less of income that they would need to pay up front and then we would abate that. So say if someone makes ten thousand dollars or less from this, which would also in turn limit the number of times they're able to rent it, then we abate their um fee structure. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
but it would have to be after the fact. And we'd have to make up for that abatement in the programming fee somewhere else, not knowing how many people would request that abatement. And again, having to pay for the other things that we already discussed. Um, again, th these are more exceptions <laughs> and more conditions than any ordinance or regulation that I found, that the Planning Commission has found. Um, so I just want folks to be aware of that there's usually like a blanket fee structure for everyone. Um, yeah. Does Woodstock, do we require, um, do we provide certain, con do we provide the short term contract that people have their ventures signed? Mm -hmm. Or is everybody allowed to make up their, their own? Mm -hmm. But when if you go say to like um, Maui and rent a house on a short-term rental, they require you to sign a contract that says, you know, if if, if you violate any of the short-term rental ordinances, mm -hmm. the first fee is twenty thousand dollars. Every additional day of, of um, violation is an additional ten thousand dollars. It's a very scary contract. Yeah, we don't. I'm not aware of anything well, like that. The regulation and the ordinance, you know, that we have like general good behavior guidelines about like trash and stuff and how people communicate what their needs are to certain guests. And, you know, I there's lots of people who don't know that we are like required to compost all of our food waste, but who knows how many people who visit here know that they need to do that. So, you know, it's hard to say what, what operators are specifically calling out. Um, yeah, or what, what fees they're putting on their guests. Because even though, and I've, Harped, you know, harped on about this for years, even though our previous regulations and ordinance were toothless. Um, I talked to a lot of people who are interested in buying homes that they could use for SPRs. And even just the notion that there is a limit and it can be enforced and you are beholden to good behavior and you know, your, your neighbors can sort of police you. I mean, that is kind of a leader. Mm -hmm. That is a kind of a uh, restriction, even if it's difficult to enforce by the letter, the spirit is pretty strong. And I think there are ways we could make the spirit stronger, even if we have a difficult time enforcing it to the letter. Um, I just think unlimited is scary for many people. And I think that, you know, it, it makes it. I would I would be very worried if a house next to me were purchased to be a short term rental that could be an unlimited short term rental. So do you have a, a thought on how that could either be enforced or monitored? So if we create something knowing that we can't enforce it. Well, I mean, how I mean, if we're if we're requiring or I just had too much coffee. If we are requiring everybody to get their short-term rental application to sign something saying that they agree. And then we actually enforce them to submit their annual report and they're immediately subject to penalty if they do not do that. And if we enforce that they have all of their renters sign something saying they agree to abide by the rules um, that govern short-term rentals in Wichita. I mean, I think there are things we can do. We don't just have to say, we can. I just look at, and I, I appreciate the spirit of things. I just look at the fact that we've had this ordinance for five years and we've got like a hundred people that have chosen not to comply. I mean, we can also say yeah. a lot of turnover over the last five years. Yeah. Oh, of course. You know, of course. We can always do better. Yeah. In the village, we haven't been able to enforce or we haven't actually I mean, enforced anything. Yeah. Uh, even though it's in an order. Well, think about the personnel change. Yeah. And, and, and the lack of manpower to, yeah. to so deal with. Yeah, that maybe if we come to a place where we're increasing rates a bit and we give some more manpower to it, I think that there's a place we can come to that allows you to have more and allows you to have more budget. And I, I think, think that this past core performance is not necessarily indicative of can't do it. But if we know that we haven't been able to do it, then it's, and we have, we need additional manpower, then that means increasing the fee, right? Increase the fee. Yeah. I think yeah. that there is like a way to increase the fee to yeah. allow yeah. your manpower. Right. And the process would still have to become annual right now. And the process has to become annual and it has to be important. And it has to be penalty. Yeah. People don't follow the rules. 
they and they don't get in one year, they've lost. They may never get back to being a legitimate short term rental in the town. And with the, you know, I think what Laura's explaining is the software at least is going to find if people are illegally operating a short term rental. It may not be able to do the days, but it can at least do something that we can't do now. But what if what if the software like right now the software could pick up anything from the people who are advertising during foliage to the people who don't need to advertise or don't need to register because they don't have a permit because they are present of the current regulation I believe in the town for certain districts requires if they're on premises and it's under a certain amount of days they don't also need a permit so again I I'm fine if we can find a way to to take into consideration the lever that we're talking about, but it will not be able to be done with the current. And we will not be able to then tell somebody with confidence and defend it confidently that they are in violation of, of the ordinance. And if I could just add to that, um, I think the ordinance was created to make it as efficient for internally as possible. Uh, the more we add on work that has to go through this, what we're saying is we have to add staff and what we're saying is we're adding staff and we have to make sure the fees cover that staff or it's going to fall on the taxpayer uh, if we're going to have a limit on how many times you can rent and we want that enforced that has to be a new staff member our current staffing will not allow that to happen um and i don't even know with the staff member if that's possible because i'm not sure how you would actually monitor that um but i just want to make clear as we're talking about this every decision has a consequence and um, I want to make that aware to the board that as we, everything, the, the more exceptions we have, the more things we have to do internally, the higher the cost internally becomes, and also the more staff will be required to fulfill that. Where in a situation where um, if it's unlimited and we have to check on people, that saves us time, um, and abatement's a great idea. That's also going to be more work on the back end to file the abatement to make sure those are, those are following through. And so I'm not saying these are bad ideas, but these ideas and solutions come with consequences at the end of the day. Definitely want to fund town. We want to fund our town offices so they can do what they need to do without being overly burdened. But you know, the current proposal has a very high fee structure for being very streamlined and is already imagining a new staff. And I think that sometimes some of the constituents that I've heard from seem to think that. But that's what's out of balance because they're very streamlined, it's making a huge amount of money. What can we do? Um, even though I know you have more work to do. <laughs> um, but for argument's sake, let's make the fees high enough that we can hire a member and we can fund the man hours and we can um, figure out ways to bring some enforcement. So your preference would be to leave the fees as they are and add somebody. Too high. I think there's a balance. I think they come down a little bit and then. No, no. I was just asking, like, if if it is, if it's moving it's like three hundred and thirty thousand dollars thing for the fee structure, if everybody, if right. every position is taken, I think that seems very high. But I think that there is a medium number lower than that that still allows for, you know, making sure that none of the burden of enforcing this is paid by the taxpayer, right? So Which is the, the number we discussed. If you want to put that on your slide, there, just the... Well, I don't know if we want to go into fees. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I think I think Carrie's point of unlimited and is a, is a valid point to talk about um, and enforcement of that. Um, but I think, you know, without higher fees, I think the planning commission, when the goal was having the higher fees pass on to the owner, was offset by the ability for them to rent more and make more income. So if we're talking about limiting the amount they can rent, but also increasing the fees. Um, that's something you, should, you can consider as well as they're going to kind of hit on both ends, uh, potentially. I know if I lived in the village, I've, I've actually been surprised we haven't had more people from the village in here talking about the unlimited number. Um, you know, for me in the R5, it, it, it made sense that you didn't have to limit it because everybody had enough land that, you know, I know of a few short-term rentals, Mary is included in my area, and they don't impact me because everybody has enough land that you're not aware of really of what's going on. When you live in the village and you're right next door to each other and you have, you know, 
person every every weekend, I can see how you know that would be upsetting. Yeah, I'm I'm on Maple Street, and behind me, off street extension at the end, they've had short term rentals over time. I, I didn't even realize that unless they get loud. And or something like there was a bridal shower there once, but we'll get into that. Um, but it's it's noise that seems to impact me more than any. But I've barely seen it, but I've heard other people say it's a horror show. You know, it's a nightmare. Um, so do I, I guess I do have a question. Does the noise ordinance in the village pertain to these SDRs? Okay. Uh, yes. Yeah. So I'm one of many, but I, I haven't had a problem. Um, are there any other uh, things with the ordinance outside of fees that people want to bring up uh, before we hop into our overall fees? I guess I'm stuck on how do we find all these people? Everything I've been hearing is That's how do we try to find yeah. who's doing it without so, signing a permit? So, the, and Frank or Lark can correct me if I'm wrong. The goal is to get the people with the permits. So I did 110 people, and the software will check daily, if not more than that, to see if people are advertising. If they're advertising. That can be cross-checked with who has a permit. If they're advertising, they don't have a permit. We'll send them a letter saying you're out of your in violation. Well, I understand that, but people that aren't advertising, we don't have a way. We don't have a way to do it now, yeah. Greg. Yeah. There's just no way. But I go, I go back to the, we don't have a way to catch someone speeding on a street if we don't have a police officer there. And we can't have a police officer on every single street. You know, if we want to hire 20 people for plan zoning and knock on doors every day, we can get no, everyone. I get it. You I know, get it. yeah. I can't do that. I'm just still going back to that one thing. How do we try to find these people? Just can't. No, I know you said do the best you can. Do the best you can. That yeah. You have. And we have this tool. And um, because when it comes to, if, if you know, if I sent a letter to somebody's house and said, you're a short term rental. And they go, no, I'm not. My brother stayed in them. I did it. Like, we can't prove it. And so, you know, then you gotta follow the money. But <laughs> for like, <laughs> somebody got paid. Yeah. No. But that times 30, right? Like, it's just. And yeah. also, there's people who are not using Airbnb probably also have people send them on Venmo or somewhere else. So, yeah. yeah. There's no way for us to see it until, you know. If there is a way in the future, the Department of Taxes was looking to cooperate with us. It's <laughs> a pipe dream for all of us in many ways. Um, we're not taking we're not taking more here. comment right now, but thank you. Uh, I think that we could, you know, we'd have we'd have another check in the checks and balances. But, you know, again, I, I hope that people are encouraged to do the right thing, you know, because there's a reason that we're doing this and it's to, you know, balance the needs of our community. It's the magnitude that we're looking at and its impact. It's not each individual person and what they bring, but it's it's the magnitude of short term rentals on what's that. And it's easier to enforce the bills. Builders can rat out their short term yeah. rentals. Although to Susan's point, one of the <laughs> one of the comments we did have was hilariously from R five. So um, it's a public meeting. So. That's right. Yeah. Um, any other comments on the ordinance outside of these? So uh, my recommendation as we go into fees, and this is my recommendation, the board can boards can say otherwise, is kind of look at it as a as a range of fees. And, and what I mean by that is we're never going to be able to tie fees to said amount of money coming in. We can't guarantee they'll have 55, 55 people signed up. If we, when we have that, we can't guarantee that everyone's going to have the same amount of Arkham's P that we predict. Uh, we can't predict if there's going to be abatements or whatever else. So instead of saying we're trying to hit a certain number, I think it's best to look at trying to hit a certain range and use that as the point of trying to back on what fees to be. Um, and that might be a better way to kind of visualize what we're going after. Um, so I threw in some random ones up there. Uh, if this is the board, way the board wants to go, I, I can adjust them as you see fit. Uh, or if you want to kind of just have a larger conversation about fees in general, by still saying fees should be smaller, fees should be larger, fees are too high, fees are too low, uh, it's not going to get us anywhere unless we have kind of what we want to 
end up at. So that's why I suggest the range. Um, but I'll take my advice from the chairs. Yeah, I'd love to just, I would love to just start off with where we were with the recommendation from the planning commission. And then I think Laura had a, had some ideas and some numbers and Ray had some numbers and I'd just be interested to see what, what those are and how. Oh, yeah, I can. Thank you. I don't know if I meant to be a but. Um, so, the Planning Commission recommended uh, a cap of 55 for both, um, a permanent fee for owner occupied at 1,000, uh, a permanent fee for non owner at 3,000, um, then RSP rates of 250 uh, per occupants based on the fire marshal um, and they estimated about three people per owner occupied about five people for uh, non owner occupied um, so that's what these numbers are right here um, that gives a total uh, fee intake of three hundred thirty thousand um, dollars so that's what was in the original proposal from the planning commission Eric, can I the original proposal was seven fifty and three oh sorry I had 750 I don't know why that didn't Sorry, I had that. I don't know why I didn't save over. My apologies. Um, so 316,250, um, what this fee structure would bring in if we had 55 on both ends, um, if the averages fell between three and five people for, for both things, um, and then there were no abatements or anything else involved. Um, something that was discussed last week, um, I believe Laura Power brought it up. Um, was the same thing on caps uh, so 55 55 lowering the permanent fees uh, to 500 then a thousand um, changing the way we do the occupancy so instead of doing uh, 250 per person it was 250 for one to four people a thousand for five to eight then two thousand dollars for nine and above um, So again, if you look at on occupied, if we're averaging thinking about three people, it'll be two fifty per per short term rental. If you're thinking around five for um, non owner occupied, it'll be a thousand dollars. That brings in a free structure of one fifty one, which is again around where the planning commission has recommended uh, fees land. Um, Six thousand dollars a week alone, but I mean that's nothing in comparison to what's going to happen. Uh, but again, we're looking at estimates. These are all based on. If everything comes in, if the average is three and five, we don't know that that's the case. Um, but based on the best knowledge we have, um, a similar another scenario that got brought in um, and Ray, this is yours. So correct me if I'm wrong or anything. Um, you kept the cap at fifty five, fifty five. You dropped the. Uh, Permanent fee unoccupied at 200, kept it at non occupied at 1500. Uh, you had $50 per occupant, which would be um, about 150 per house, uh, then about 250 for non occupied, uh, which brings uh, a fee structure about 115,000 in 500, um, which would is below, again, what the planning commission recommended, but kind of also in that range of 100 to 175,000. $175,000. Um, so those are just three examples, one from the Planning Commission, one from Laura, one from Ray. Um, I also asked the board to do some homework. I don't know if anyone did it or not. I'm not going to check. Um, but I have other tabs open up if we can also play around with these numbers um, to kind of get a sense of, as we talk about fees, what it actually look like at the end of the day. Um, so the board's kind of a better idea of what we're talking about. Uh, so just to give an example, this is no one, so we made um, equal fees. Um, 50 per occupant, you know, that's $132,000. If you suddenly move permanent fees for 
owner occupied to 750, you know, it goes down. So it's a way for us to kind of play with things, you know, live and in person and kind of get a sense of what we're actually talking about, how that actually shake out. Um, so when we talk about what we want to do, this is this could give us an example of looking at what it'll look like. And that's and, and that just with the minimum. So if somebody has a lot this is the average. So for we're doing three for owner occupied, five for non owner occupied. And this assumes all permits are taken up. Yes. And right now, the sense of owner occupied is going to fall well below 55. Yeah, I think the planning commission was reckoned probably assume around 35 the first year. Is that correct? Yeah. And you assume that you're going to fill all 55 of the non owner occupied? Yeah. So I'd kind of like to see what the numbers look like with 35. If we think that that's as many as we're going to get off the bat. Yeah. So Planning Commission goes to 286. Um, Laura would go down to 136. Uh, and Ray would go to 108. And again, this is why we talk about estimates and ranges because, you know, we're saying 35, it could be 25, it could be 55. We, we, we don't know, you know. Um, that's why I, I want to stay away from trying to be very specific in a certain, in a certain number um, and kind of having a range um, to cover us. Because again, if we only have 35 permits for unoccupied, that may mean less work on our end, so we may need less fees. Uh, we also don't know how much work it's going to take. We also don't know what's going to happen. Uh, so trying to drill down on one single number is a useless exercise. I think it's important to remember, and we had this discussion at least, that that we can pass the ordinance and then separately pass the fee structure, which means that the fees can be changed much more easily. So if all of a sudden we realize, oh my gosh, we're overcharging, then we can drop the fees quickly. If all of a sudden we realize, oh my gosh, we're not charging enough, we can raise them. If anything happens that gives the boards the ability much more quickly. So this is not, at least in my mind, and correct me if I'm wrong, this is not something that is set in stone. This is something that we can be a bit more responsive. Certainly, we're not going to do it all the time. But. Yeah, I think this should be. A, I understand that fees would only be changed at a reasonable like once a year or something. At minimum, yeah, yeah. because you're a, you don't want to confuse people doing it. You, the more we change, the more work mm -hmm. on the back end they're confusing. So I think it's more. I think one of the goals was have this one go in place, have it passed, have the planning commission review it over the course of the year, and then come back to the board and say, hey, this is working great. No changes needed. We need to, or maybe need to make changes here or there and kind of have that audit done within the first year. And that could guide the boards going forward. Trustees, what are your thoughts on? Somebody's got to start talking. I, I, I like the range that I'm looking at. If we're going to go with a range of 110 to 160. And so of these three options, you have a. Well, well, I mean, I, I, let's just, I just mean, to a range. Yeah. Accommodates two. Mm -hmm. or the range, you think. Yeah. Yeah. Mine has a fee structure of one to two for owner occupied and owner occupied base fee. Right. So I have a little bit of a different structure. I am. Um, I agree. Um, Sorry. Same thing as Jeff is that. That the two proposals, what is it, 100 to, mm -hmm. I agree with that. I'm going to get bigger. I'm just trying to type. When you you have to get I'm on. I'm on. I'm on. I'm on. I'm on. I'm on. Yeah, I'm in agreement. That's fine. Having a team be so much more than yours. With our best estimate. Yeah. yeah. I think I'm looking at what Laura has proposed scenario one. I think that that. What do you like about that one? One, I think it opens us less to litigation since the disparity between owner occupied and non owner occupied isn't so huge. 
um, I, I think that the fees will carry the burden of the administration, um, but they don't seem so onerous as to be punitive, particularly to owner output. Um, I agree with Carrie. I think uh, Laura's proposal is, you know, right on the money. Um, I don't think that we should go below the requested amount that the planning commission needs, though, which is roughly 140, 145,000. So that would be my low. We should absolutely not go below that. But this does go below that. Well, it goes below, but this is, of course, only looking at 35 owner right. occupied. It is right. not tapped out. Yeah. Right. So if you do that, then you hit the number. Right. Yeah. And again, just to knock into grave detail, I mean, does any of the board member want to suggest a range other than the 110 to 160? No. I would like to see the owner occupied lower, and I would like to see it at 500 total because I think those are the people who you don't have to worry about a cap. They are already capped at, at probably what they do now. Um, I think having a higher fee is much more of a burden on someone who's occupying the place and having to just rent it. Pay. So you like this one then, since that's 500? No. 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 Oh, with the, you mean with the 250? Yeah. yeah. Oh. But it's I, I 2000 with it for the non owner side. I, I like the. I think owner occupied is right too. So the thing about owner occupied is that it's being treated as a whole. So this could be a bedroom in somebody's apartment. This could also or in someone's house. This could also be. Yeah. This could also be an ADU or a garage apartment on someone's property. So, you know, like it's being treated the same. I just want to give context. So that's why the base the occupancies make it a little bit more equitable because the idea is that more income is able to be generated based on the occupant or the room amount. Um, if we go down that far, it just means that non-owner occupied has to absorb that cost. But it wouldn't have been done. Out, out completely? So again, if you're doing this, then you also want to do the same thing for non-occupied, so you're not treating them completely different. Or you do the 300 permit fee when you have you still have an occupancy fee. Yeah. Okay. 200. 200. Just say that again, sorry? Permit fee, 300 occupancy fee. Is that per person or well so that would be for so that would be for he's giving that as an average but on the left hand side it's right 250 for one to four so you would want to change those numbers on the side yeah so it would be 250 would be 200 instead of yeah. 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 um but it's just to focus on if, if we're okay with the range which is, I feel from the 10 of you, we're okay with the range. Yeah. I think that we can get into the details specifically of what we want. Um, but I don't know if we want to go back now to the other stuff people want to talk about because if we're okay with the range of fees, it's now just math. And it's very simple to get somewhere where we want to be. Um, but if we want to revisit any of the other outstanding concerns we have, because those are things that are going to, I think, hold us back if, you know, if we're, okay with the R5 being treated as everyone else is, if we're okay with the unlimited rentals going on, um, then I think we can kind of really go in the details on the math. But I think we want to make sure we're okay with all that before we dig into everything else. I'm not okay with unlimited rentals. <clears throat> is there anybody else that's not okay with unlimited rentals? Okay, so there's two people. Yeah, I think there ought to be a, some sort of a number. So if you just had a number for town and village wide yeah so so right now people in the town don't have a cap on well, how much they can rent so no, they, don't. No. they don't so now you'll be putting town so you, you'll be putting a cap on people in the town who currently oh, don't have that that's 
Yeah. Well, R5, but town was 10 or 10 cents per year. Town five was unlimited. Yeah. But, town yeah. but R5, our, our yeah. So I think there should be a cap for five. And it can be a higher cap, but I think there needs to be something that we can, even if it's 20 times per year. But I don't know how you can enforce it. Well, we were just talking about it. You have an annual letter. They have to submit their report. We just start making people do things. Give me, I can send an annual letter saying I only did it twice. Well, if you want to perjure yourself, then you can do that. Well, it's worth that's that a decision might. you make. I think the, the problem is, is if you purchase, we can't, like, even if we ask for all of that, you're then adding more work, which is, is fine if we have the manpower, but we are, we are building a department that does nothing but short-term rentals. Like we are creating people well, we're, that we're also looking to hire a person that there's nothing. Yeah. And that's fine. But like, we're deciding that it's not just one thing that planning and zoning does. Like, like it might take more than one person to, to do that. And then get into the legal things of, okay, they said six, but the neighbor said that it was 10. And I mean, so it's just how granular do you want to get? So that's why I think it should be a higher number. Yeah. But it, it is just really a lever that's there. So that is so that we have a mechanism to if somebody became a flagrant violator. And I think it's not unreasonable to expect people to perform the things that we're asking them to perform in exchange for having the ability to make this money. I completely agree with you. I I just I can't find the enforcement. Like beyond like try really hard. Like I don't see I, I would be fine with a lower amount. Like I, I like the idea of a cap. I just don't know how we can do it in a way that will work. Are we, I just yes. clarify, are we talking about a cap and up from a cap and a cap on the number of times rental too? Yes. Okay. Oh, so two caps. I thought we were just well, talking. Well, 55, 55. Oh, yeah. No, that's. And, then, yeah, and no. then a cap on the number of times. So, call it 15 times per year, 20 yeah. times per year. If, if I could, uh, Stephen Bauer is here. I don't know if he can answer this question, but Stephen, can you? If you can, in what way, if possible, could an, an office enforce limited how many times the short term rental could be rented in this year? If there's a way at all. Yeah. Stephen Bauer, Director of Planning and Zoning, as the, uh, as the uh, potential person that would be overseeing either the program directly or overseeing the person that would enforce this. Um, Carrie, I got to say, it, it's not impossible. It's absolutely not impossible. Um, the The problems that I've seen, the problems that we heard uh, through the Planning Commission is that we have to get more invasive. Uh, we have to collect uh, different types of data that people don't are not always comfortable with giving up, uh, including like, you know, income on <clears throat> on these returns and um, so we try to stay as much away from being super invasive um, and just the general idea that, I mean, I, I just want to say it, it's not impossible. Um, what I'm thinking is, is there's no way that the, the number goes under one full-time employee doing nothing but short-term rentals all the time, including also probably some joint staff that we now have to take. Um, we can't cut David out of the program. Uh, we can't cut police out of the program. Again, that's part of that. Yeah. Um, I mean, not completely, and we haven't done so under this ordinance. What we're saying is under the proposed ordinance, we still give them the authority, but not part of their day-to-day -day life. Um, that's where un under the proposal of, you know, I think this, this whether it be me or whether it be a different short-term officer uh, that is just doing this as their full-time job, uh, they would still need to tax at least partially other departments to, to help in a more meaningful way. Um, I don't have exactly what that would cost. Um, but when you're thinking about just like enforcing uh, speeding tickets, if when someone that goes in front of the Judicial Bureau, when someone... Um, you know, says I wasn't speeding or I didn't see the sign or there's some sort of condition, I would like a hearing. That law enforcement officer has to go to the court and has to defend that. Um, so you think about every time someone does this and we get a report, um, <clears throat> it, it, it's just the, the man hours. Uh, and that's why we went to the simplicity route. Yeah, but to, 
So are you saying, Stephen, that it's enforceable somehow through the through David and through our police that if someone is renting, that they can be? Yeah. What I'm saying is it takes more officers. Uh, it takes more physical inspection. Uh, it takes more random drive-bys. It takes more knocking on the door. Um, it takes, uh, you know, because the, what the software is really, really good at, it, it is incredible at being able to say, are you advertising this? Are you not advertising this? And that's how we wrote it up to say, well, let's stop it there because that's what it's really good at. Um, it is not perfect. And as Laura pointed out, the Department of Taxes doesn't share that information. Airbnb, Verbo, and the other 85 definitely don't share that information. And so that's the part where we have to have random calls. Uh, so we, we, we do this where we call property managers and say, hey, I'm coming by uh, tomorrow morning at nine. Uh, and so we do kind of spot inspections and stuff like that. And so what I'm saying is it's, it's not impossible to try and get a range. Uh, it is more difficult. I think that takes it from, you know, as we propose this ordinance, I feel like we're at a at, at 85 to 90 percent range of knowing who's doing this. I, I think we could with if you're willing to put the resources towards it, uh, we go from we're currently at 40 percent knowing clearly who is doing this. I mean, this could maybe go to a closer uh, 50 to 70. And if you're comfortable with that and willing to put the resources towards that, um, I, I think I, our department could get behind. Um, hopefully that answers. Helps. That was Thank very you, helpful. You Thank you. Uh, I didn't have my question. Okay. Um, so my question. All right. So, so far what I've gathered is we're going to buy software that's that can only achieve three quarters of the project that we need to do. Okay, correct? Yep. Okay. And there's there's nothing else on the market that that does it better. Okay. And then um is there any enforcement that we can do if someone isn't complying? Uh, under this proposed ordinance, under under the current structure or going forward, if we if we go with this particular system, what what is the enforcement if you find that someone's not following the rules? What is the enforcement? Yeah, so they, uh, so the, the scenario that you're talking about is we have the list of permits of people that we know are registered. Yep. We see something advertised, it runs every 10 minutes. Yep. We get a notification, we schedule when the report comes through, and it says this person doesn't match our database. They're advertising. Uh, we can closely monitor that. Uh, by that, we can, we can still go through, we can still call, con connect with the, with the property owner and say, hey, we know this, we're monitoring this. Um, and if we monitor it and we see, okay, well, it looks like they, they are doing what we're now collecting evidence. So we collect evidence as we go forward saying, you're both advertising and it looks like you're operating. Both of those are illegal under this ordinance. Whether you advertise without a registration or you operate without a registration. Uh, so the enforcement mechanism is we, we actually do a citation, just the same way as if you're speeding or you get a parking ticket. And the way that we enforce that is through the Judicial Bureau, rather than uh, currently with the regulation, we would enforce that through the process that ends up in the environmental court, which is much slower. Uh, the Judicial Bureau is really built for um, ordinance enforcement and violations. So that is our that's our path forward. All right, so are you saying that David and our our police department really couldn't do anything about it? Yeah, they could, because under the ordinance, we also included them as issuing officers. Okay. So you have a short-term rental officer, whoever that is. Uh, you have the municipal manager. You have police mm -hmm. officers, and you have the fire department. So in my mind, one of the goals of having a limit is more of a deterrent, and I don't think no matter what enforcement or how much money we put toward it, we're going to catch everyone who's breaking rules. But when Carrie goes to show a house and somebody is thinking that they're going to make a ton of money as a short-term rental and she can mm -hmm. say there is a limit and it should be more than it is now. I mean, people should be able to make a living, but you know, maybe they'll think twice about buying that house. The ultimate goal of this ordinance, as I understand, is to increase long-term rental and workforce housing and not have as many houses going towards short-term rental. And I think that not with 
saying that we're not going to have any limit really doesn't achieve the goal of the ordinance. If I could just speak to that. Again, correct me if I'm wrong. I think the hope of the Planning Commission is knowing that we already have an abundance of unoccupied short-term rentals. The cap of 55 would get rid of 50, 60 of them. And then the cap of owner-occupied is already below 55. So that, that's going to go up. So I think the cap of the Planning Commission put in place was a trigger to say, if you're not living here, odds are you're not going to have a short-term rental. If you are living here, we're going to give you the ability to rent out the apartment for your taxes, rent out the garage for your taxes. Um, I think uh, a limit on how many you can do a year will be another trigger to that as well, if the board wants to go that way. Um, but if I'm correct me if I'm wrong, if the planning commission, that was kind of the original goal of the cap, right, was kind of say, get rid of the unoccupied that go over, motivate them to do long-term rentals, but allow unoccupied to kind of come up to a higher number. Um, I just want to know, I don't know, what do you guys know what the average number of days is for a stay? Yeah, like if we say 20, is it usually seven days? Is it, what do you think? I don't, I don't know. Oh, we have a minimum requirement for some of the zones that it's a two minimum, two night minimum, two night minimum thank you. Um, okay, thank you. Yeah. Are there other? I just don't know how you're gonna force a. I guess what I'm saying is that you, it, it, I'm not sure. I mean, I think you have to rely on the people that are getting the permit to report honestly when they are applying for next year's permit. And, you know, I don't think we want to throw a lot of money at catching 100%. But if we can, if 85% of the people are saying uh, will abide by a limit, and a house won't sell because we to a, somebody who's only going to do short term rentals because we have a limit, then I think it's well worth it. Exactly. But I think and we do need to make it a realistic limit. I think it's, I do think it's low right now. I do think it's low, right? I would be, and I'm glad you brought up Stephen. I would be comfortable having a limit, but only if there is a way that we can independently verify it and whether it's you need to turn in your tax returns or you have to do whatever because we there are lots of reasons that people would turn in incorrect information and and most of it is probably not malicious and so if what we wanted to be able to do is truly say that people are following the rules that their neighbors you know neighbors don't want to come forward because they're scared or whatever it is or we're not going to catch them like we need to be able to rely on something other than Oh yeah, here's my piece of paper, and it's probably right. Like some people are good at bookkeeping, some people aren't. And so, if we really want to be able to have this and enforce it the best we can, then I would say we need to have it has to be your tax return, or it has to be something that says that in black and white, something legal. And so, whatever that is, I would I would say the the planning commission can figure that out, or whatever the best practices of other places are. But I'm not willing to just say. Oh yeah, just write this down because it it can go wrong in so many ways, um, and it also is open for. Um, we want to talk about our liability. Somebody could turn something in; it could be right, it could be wrong. They could turn something in, and we go, "Oh, you actually hit seven months when it was supposed to be six months worth of days," and they go, "No, if you look at it this way, it it makes it much muddier." So, any way to make it clearer on our side and on the owner side. I think we need to build that in, like very specific documentation, whatever it happens to be. But that's that would be the teeth is, OK, you can do this and it's only going to be 100 days, but you have to give us tax returns or whatever it happens to be. The import of the limit on the number of times per year to me is what Susan is saying. It's more of a deterrent that changes the profile of Woodstock as a place that's not just wide open to somebody who is interested in the property solely for a short-term rental. Um, but 55 think, of those will be, and it won't ever be. No, we already have 55 of them. We have 20. Yeah, and so we can't, and we can't have more than 55. Well, we can have somebody who's like, okay, I'll stay in it one weekend, or, or you know, I'll, I'll stay in it the minimum, and then I'll rent it as much. And that's a different profile, I think, than what we typically look for in our on our occupied and in our S, and our SDR, because they're not allowed to do it unlimited times per year. So then what is the, we're talking about the number, the 
because I think we're talking about impacts, and I think everyone has a different idea of what impact is, which is how the original ordinance and regulations are structured. So are we talking about what are we talking about number of stays? Because like Lisa pointed out, stays can vary in length. Like what are we and are we also talking about allowing the top bar to continue to be unlimited? Are we going to have them come in compliance and right. create the equals everyone else? Everybody's got to be the same size. Yeah. I think if we have a, a reasonable limit, then it makes sense to apply it equally across the board. Um, I would be in favor of something that's like a two night minimum for. Uh, <laughs> Good morning. You know, what's the number? Is it 15 stays per year or 20 stays per year? Something like that. Then that's, that's a lot of weekends, but most people will be focusing on. High seasons, they're not going to be interested in the mud season. People like to do longer rentals because it's less wear and tear on property. Um, I mean, 16 is far too few for what is currently in the village. Well, it's six plus unlimited, right? In the like, foliage. If you're, if you're living there. Yeah. Not if you're a non owner. Oh, that's right. right. Thank you. So I just want to clarify something. We're saying that we're potentially leaning towards. Kind of limit on how much people can rent um, over the year, um, knowing that that is going to probably take more person hours, which means we can raise more fees to offset that. So, what we're kind of talking about now is having higher fees with less return for the short term rental person uh, to then monitor the amount of times they can rent it. Um, so that's kind of where we're at now. So a higher fee structure to allow more staffing, to allow more enforcement on how many times someone can rent it over the course of a year. I would like to see that if, I mean, I think if we raise the number enough, I'm not sure that there's that many people who actually need to rent that much. So I would like to still see a, you know, try to do a trial year of not staff until we know we actually need except for the people that work has to get done even if there's no staff no no i know but not adding staff to do this enforcement work that's what i'm saying so not enforcing it for the first year well asking seeing how it works to have people voluntarily report so it's creating something without creating without allowing any enforcement which is there's no point in creating something if we can't force it but I don't think we can really enforce it anyway. Well, we know we can enforce it with this software. We've talked about if we want to if we want to limit the amount of times and we can ask for tax returns or something else. But to create a rule that we cannot enforce, and it, nothing will be 100%, but we can't create something that we can't enforce because it's not fair to all the people that don't have short-term rentals. So if you're asking, I don't. I guess I don't understand why the staffing is augmented just by having a limit when if you're having people turn because it. Because the more because the more well it's not like somebody's just going to turn that in that that takes and i can't speak to this Stephen can probably speak to this but the, the, the more rules that we have the more exceptions the more times you have to check on somebody and i'm suggesting more, that we don't check other than getting the tax i mean at least try for try to see if we can do it getting those just, tax returns and then also creates another layer of it's not like oh i've just gotten 100 110 tax returns and i'm just going to plug it in right like I don't think that this is an easy process to manage, and I don't want to assume that it is. And if if in a year we find out it's a super easy process, I would be pleasantly surprised. But then we have to cut staff. So that's what I'm saying is let's see if we if, you know, before you add the layer, see if it is an easy process. And so then in the meantime, we hire a temporary staff person. Well, you hire whoever you were thinking to do. You're you're going to hire somebody if we don't have a limit, correct? I mean, I think it depends on what we end up deciding. I mean, I think he, what Stephen was saying was it's possible that you're going to need one full person to do this. We'll find that out. But we know that adding a limit of how many ever days per year to rent is going to add more work. And so more likely that you need a person to do that. Yeah, I don't, I guess I don't. You don't think it's going to be that much work? I don't know, but I don't want to. I would rather not add staff 
and find out it wasn't much work. But if we don't add staff, then you're stressing on the staff that we have, and then it can't be enforced because we don't have the staff to do it. Well, and then, so then we, at the end of this year, we say, okay, we weren't able to enforce. So we stress out the staff we have for a year. Okay, no. I think the debate <laughs> is between whether or not the taxpayers are paying for this or the operators are paying for this, honestly, because I think right now, if we don't add staff, we are, the general taxpayer is paying for it, just like they're paying for the software right now. It's a budget, a line item in the budget, the general taxpayers are paying for it this year. Oh, I'm totally against that. Well, <laughs> thank you, Jeffrey. And oh. we, <laughs> we already passed it. Next year, it will be a zero line item if this is funded. Um, I think maybe I'm trying to find a way forward here. I think that. How many people are working in Sending and Zen right now? Two. Two. All right. Is it, how many people are working? And standing in zoning while you guys were creating these rules. Two. two. And how many people? Yes, two people have been staffed in planning and zoning for a long year. time, which is again, okay. this hasn't been able to be enforced. This has also not been a priority for David's office for the police because we have not said this is a priority for us and because we have not put staffing behind it. And adding a person is part of the hundred and forty five thousand dollar estimate. Yeah. Correct. It's in there. Yes, yeah. and I think the most important compliance piece will be handled by the software. We want to make people register. To me, the limit on the number of times per year is really more of a maintaining a certain profile of short term rental owner in Woodstock. I'm less concerned about people flouting a uh, uh, numbers of times per year rented. I, I, it, to me, it's just really important as a as a statement. A statement that we say we can't enforce. Well, I, I think we can enforce. We can enforce, require certain things. Yeah. I mean, I think there are ways we can do it. Like any business owner, and that's what these people are business. Yes. Owners, any mm -hmm. business owner can lie about what they're doing. Yeah. And if that's how they choose to behave, then we can do nothing about that with us. But I am assuming good behavior. So that's and and we and, and we are will require that they, you know, whatever it is, along with whatever tax documentation it is. And I think most people are good actors. And if they're not, then we will have, you know, as much leverage as we can. What's the number you're thinking would uh, dissuade a pure investor who just wants to buy a house here purely to rent? Short term rental. I think it's somewhere between 15 and 20. 15 and 20 what? Rentals per year. Is that days per year or rentals per year? I can't hear. That's low. 15? Right now it's six. In the village. Yeah, I, I know, but we're changing this structure. And does that mean, I'm sorry, is it 50 rentals per year? Does that mean 50 days per 15 year? 15 rental right. occurrences per year. Okay. Two days yeah. of Okay, so that a rental occurrence could be two days, it could be two weeks. It could be two days, it could be 29. Mm -hmm. Anything below 30. Okay. We're getting a look back there. <laughs> oh, okay. I I feel like that's low. Yeah, I do too. Um, especially for the fees we're gonna charge. We're gonna charge. And, and second, I've been listening to the public comment. They have like eight weeks here of the foliage, and they've got six weeks here in May, and they've got so there's we'll make it 30. What make it whatever it is. I got just throwing out a number starts with whatever. Yeah, I, I'm well, just saying Harry, would you be against like just nights instead of like 15 stays, it'd be 15 nights or something like sure. that? Okay. Maybe that's a better way to view it of a, how many actual times you could rent it out. That makes the math yeah. you know, that it costs five hundred dollars a night. Yeah. Then that makes it easier to enforce. Yeah. Um so what would that be? So what do you think it would be in days? That would be maybe it's Maybe it's half half an idea, year, something like that. Maybe March, beginning of March for the end of the season. 
Um, Stephen or Frank or Laura, did you guys find in looking at any other towns that have ordinances, do they have caps on the amount of rentals? Any sort of best practices? Yeah, just any kind of best practices? No, there's not a, do they have a limit at all? No. It's well, not really. I mean, I know where my, where my son lives, they have. It's by zone. Yes. Because I was zone. listening to, I was overhearing a conversation with the realtor showing someone else, and they were like, well, if you buy there, you're only going to be able to rent X amount. But if you buy over here, you're unlimited. So I, I think it's by zone. zone. Yeah. That limit. It is by zone. But I, yeah, I mean, I think, again, the argument is like how we're going to enforce it. And most of the most of the towns and the cities that we looked at, you know, they, the big difference is between what is considered an owner occupied and a non owner occupied because the impact is considered greater with a non owner occupied. Um, a lot of the towns that have ordinances aren't enforcing them. I mean, that's the, that's the state of it. Like Killington, has them. Killington has the software. They charge fees, they do not enforce this. Did they, did they hire someone to do fees? No. Linda and Derek just hired someone to do mm -hmm. their work, but they don't they don't have any software. So I don't know if that's an offset or not. But um, and the and the software is a tool, it's not a enforcement tool. mechanism. It is yeah. a tool. It, we still have to do work based on what yeah. it tells you. Um, just to kind of stick to Carrie's suggestion: Is the select board okay with all short-term rentals in Woodstock having? a cap on how much they can rent per year, knowing that there are some now who are currently unlimited. If it can be applied evenly to all zones, then I'm fine investigating it. If it can be what? Applied evenly. Okay. The owner occupied, non owner occupied in all zones, including those that are currently unlimited. That's realistic. That's realistic. I, I ask because I, I don't know. know. I don't know either. I mean, I think. You know, if you look at numbers, I think it has to be at least 150 nights. I think if you said something like 180, then, I mean, people are still allowed to do, you know, anything over 30 days is not a short-term rental. And a lot of our, particularly our owner-occupied, they have people who rent for a month at a time during ski season. So anything longer than that doesn't count toward their total. Is that going to include foliage? We're taking the foliage. Sounds like there's no discussion about the foliage. Foliage agnostic. Yeah, it would just be 150, or it would be X number per year, no matter. Because for season. years, foliage time has been basically, for, you know, open door for anything. I mean, so that would be 60 days. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, yeah. What if you are a short term rental and you rent for, say, two months? That rental does not count towards your short term rental. Even if you're a short term. Yeah, it doesn't yeah. count. So you can be they both. Can 30 and then if it okay. shows 180, they can do 210 days. Okay. I mean, 180 sounds high. That's half a year. But if we're going from unlimited to 180, that's less. Yeah, that's a whole lot less. <laughs> Yeah, that's a problem now. I think uh, restricting them how many times they can do it and raise the fees. But it's a huge change. It's 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 a big that, number. Too. It's a that's a big generous number. I, yeah. And if you think about how many months per year nobody wants to come there anyway. But you take away the people that are unlimited, which I didn't realize when I spoke before. But some places. Yeah, the R fives have been unlimited. unlimited. But my guess is that no, at least the only one everywhere. Yeah. I don't think. But we don't have any photo to look at. No. Whirling dirt. But if we go to 180 days, that would be really low. Well, but can we lower the fees? It's so much more than it's so many more days than they're allowed now. Right? Yeah. Okay. How so many? Right now, the foliage period is defined as how many days that they can do it. Six and that's only right. owner occupied, right? Only like six, only weeks. Only so that's six weeks. 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 Six weeks.
I think it was six weeks. Right, five weeks? Six weeks. Six weeks. Six weeks. Six weeks. Six weeks. What is it? Like seven. Oh, okay. So it's five weeks yeah. ish. But they're truly here in three, three weeks years. early. So it's more like eight weeks. But then those are, yeah. those are the dates. Yeah, they go. Yeah. Anybody else like 180? So, I mean, let me just back up. I think we're doing the same thing we're doing with the fees. Mm -hmm. I think. You want a range? Not a range, but we're saying if, if we, we first agree that both boards are okay with limited amount of times per year, and if everyone's okay with that, then I think we talk about our. Some kind of, I mean, what does 180 to it really mean in the grand scheme of things, especially if we're not fully enforcing it or we're trying our hardest? Um, so I think the first question is Are we okay as a joint board with having a limit on how many times the short term rental can rent it over the course of a year? And if the, if, the, if the answer is yes, then we can kind of drill down to what number should be. If the answer is no, we can go back to have that larger conversation at all. So for village short-term rentals, it would be a dramatic increase in how many times they could rent it. For town, it would be outside of the R5, it would be a massive increase. And for this one zone, it would be, in, in theory, a decrease from unlimited to an X amount. So I'm going to go back to what I said earlier, which is if we have absolutely no way to monitor with the software how many times somebody's renting, are we going to pay uh, a spy for a hundred days to watch and see if somebody's renting? So it makes no sense. So that was the original proposal of the planning commission to not have the limits, right? I agree. To not then have to worry about investigating it. Yeah. I think what the plan zone director said, um, and I think Carrie said as well, is if we want to actually have a limit and enforce it, we're going to need staff to okay. enforce it. Um, and we're, we're going to need staff to do this work anyways, regardless of enforcement. The more we want our staff to do with this ordinance, the more staff we're going to have to have to follow through with that. Um, and and possibly just, the more owners of, of, of a process for owners, because if they have to then submit reports or whatever's decided, that is then more work for the owners. It's more work for... Well, it's supposed to be submitting reports now. Yeah. Yeah, which... I I do, but and and I mean everything should you know everything should be anything that's rented should the fire marshal should give an okay on it. I mean it's just normal proceedings. Well, the fire marshal do that. Yeah. What's that? Fire marshal do that on the board too. Right. But I'm just saying, yeah, it's, a, it's normal operating procedure, really. Nothing out of the ordinary. If if we can come up with a Rate fees that are reasonable. I have to respond to okay. that. Would just have to see the process or, or process to do the best that we can, knowing that we're not going to grab everybody, knowing that you can't make everybody comply. Okay. And then again, in a year, be able to look at it again and say, is it working? Is it not? Okay. So let's say in a world we have a cap at 55 55, limited rentals per year of 180 nights per year. Um, and then we go back to the fee structure for that. And we saw it at Lara's, which 500, 1,000, 250, 1,000, depending on occupancy, that gets us to 150, 150. Um, yeah, I think that was the thing that the profile will stay the same for the people applying for the Do you think it'll change? I mean, just for hypothetical numbers, you're allowed 180 nights and you charge $150 a minute. So that's $27,000. Doesn't seem like an onerous no. permit fee. So, Laura, in your comment, do you, based on everything, oh, no, 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 I'm not, I don't want to call you up, but based on everything you, <laughs> every, everything you guys have done, you have, are the experts in this at, the, at this table. Um, if we had when the original ordinance was unlimited, if we put a cap of 180 with a free structure kind of like this, do you think we'd still have 55 unoccupied 
lined up? Do you think we still hit around 25, 35 owner occupied? I, we might see it. I don't know. I think we might see an increase in owner occupied, maybe a decrease in non owner occupied, probably an increase in litigation. I don't know. <laughs> I, yeah, I, I'm for it. I just don't know. And I'm, yeah, I don't know. Maybe Stephen can speak to to it better about what <laughs> it's hard. It's hard. It's hard to track. I mean, you know, Mary and Christina have come here and given testimony that they can't rent all year round. So, you know, that makes sense. But there are people who can, and so, I, yeah. I don't, I don't I collect more data on it if there was a way to. I don't. No, it's defeated. No, oh. I mean, I there's, there's yeah. a problem we're all trying to strike, yeah. Out, yeah. which is which is figure out how this can, you know, retain the rural character, allow people to create income from their properties. Um, but also cap this, and I think that that's and pay for it, and that's what we're trying to figure out. So um, again, I'm partial to the structure that I propose, <laughs> um, and I think with 180 days that's fine. But I also think it will take, you know, beyond the staffing we've currently accounted for, it'll take maybe more time, you know, from the other enforcement officers as well, which is depends on how we want to do that with, you know, our powers and our purge. We want to tell David that we do this and we want to tell, yeah, yeah. So, sorry, I'm trying to really, I couldn't be further away in the corner to let you just debate this without me interrupting. Um, but I do want to just bring our attention to one thing of, of, of this is that with the with the permit reduction, uh, putting a limit of, a, say, 180 days, um, one of the big justifying reasons, I believe, Laura, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, of the difference between owner occupied and non owner occupied by definition, owner occupied is limited to 182 days. Um, non owner occupied doesn't have that same sort of limit. So the reason why it's a two to one is because you essentially have twice as many days to rent. So that is where the difference in the in the permit fee. Um, so just something I, I feel like while we're going on this, I, I, I wanted to interrupt to, to share that. Um, yeah. yeah, so for owner occupied is just uh, submitted uh, homestead declaration. By the definition of what a homestead declaration, that limits you to renting 182 days per year. Uh, as a non-homestead, you are not limited. In theory, you could rent 360, I don't know why anyone would ever want to do that, but you could rent 365 nights per year as a non-homestead. So therefore, your automatic economic difference is two to one on just the possibility. Is that Renting the whole property or renting a portion of the property? Renting the, the whole property. So, so a homestead, though, could still rent a portion of the property for more than a homestead. Correct. And currently, both the owner-occupied and the non-owner-occupied are both limited to 15 village tenants. Yep. And then it gets, you know, 10 gets in days. some areas and 15 in some areas. And, um, so currently, they're the same. Certainly, yes. Yes. Currently, owner-occupied, non-owner-occupied, because they're not currently defined. Um, as that uh, are the same across the district. They have the same limit per zoning district. And the only other thing is we still predict the 30 to 35 for owner occupied. Oh, yeah. Okay. Thank you. So my question for the boards right now, um, <laughs> we have about 20 minutes left before there's a meeting at 730. Um, the original recommendation by the Planning Commission was to have this ordinance being voted on um, by May 1st. 
so it could go into effect on July 1st, so they have a clean cut way to start working towards the permanent and everything else, and the ordinance is set up that way and structured. Um, we have about a week left before we get um, into May. Um, and so if we really want to have this ordinance done and have a vote on it by next week, early next week, we really need to drive down for the next 20 minutes and schedule probably two more meetings in the next five working days uh, to get this done. Um, the other option is we can kick around some ideas and have either the boards, myself, the planning commission, planning zoning, go back and bring some more information to to, to the forefront. Uh, but I did want to kind of make everyone aware of the timeline we're, we're facing right now. Um, so if we, if we really want to get this done, I think we should really kind of drill down um, or, you know, keep having this kind of overview conversation with the assumption that we can set a different timeline going forward. Well, I'm fine with the 180. I'm not fine with the owner-occupied fees. I think it's, I think 500 bucks for owner-occupied is good. Instead of 750. So you'd like to see the, the permanent fee for or if I go down to like 250? 250, 250. Can we see what that's? I don't know if that. I have no problem with that. Um, now, is this taking into consideration? The cap on how many nights as well, or is that? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Jeffrey. Um, I'm just concerned that doesn't supply enough money for the what planning zone is telling us they need to enforce and regulate this. Well, so this is with 35. Right, which is where we are now. Yeah. So what is Where's it? the rest of the? So, if there's going to be more people, then it'll bring in more money. Eventually, right, but they're they're the assumption is the first year, the first year is we'll only good. have 35 owner occupied. Oh, that was work that was built into, yeah, that's why we were looking years. at 35 in the future. It might be 55, which got well, us up to like that 130. I'll the projection is 30, it's not 35. Oh, okay. Oh, I don't know if you want to see that. Or... Oh, yeah. <laughs> Even numbers done, I'm okay, and again, there's also. Supposes that unoccupied is going to be one to four people, and that unoccupied is going to be between five and eight. Yeah, that's a prediction. I guess my question for Ray is then, if you want it to pop out at two at five hundred total, then we need to have varying occupancy fees for non-owner occupied and owner occupied. Well, you can no, do five to eight. I think. Yeah, yeah. I'm talking about one to four. Okay. Yeah. So five to eight, knock, knock yourself off. Two hundred twenty fifty bucks. Care. Well, we do want to care, um, just because. <laughs> um, but no, I know, but you these, know what I mean. These, these fees have to be reasonable right. to what it costs to run the program, and we say when it costs twice as much for unowned occupied, um, or they can rent twice as much. That's a reasonable thing to make. Few is more saying it's now a quarter um, less to do. On our pride versus annual pride, like we can't just have fees to have fees. They have to be reasonably expectation of what it costs to run the program. Um, and so we want to be very careful with how we structure them, not to just to make sure that we're doing it in a way that is what it actually costs to run the program. And we don't know what that actual dollar amount is. We have the estimate of 145, but we sort of all agreed on a range of 110 to well, 160. Yeah. What is the permit be? 360. I mean, we, I mean, it's 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 more the spirit of the fees, making sure they're um what are they, the difference between unoccupied and uh, owner occupied, not you know. And if we're limiting non-owner occupied as well, we're we're changing also the definitions of. The, the basis of the definition of why we have, why we're charging more in fees. Yeah. 
but it's still going to cost the same. So, yeah. So it may be a sense where we would have to say something like 500 for an owner occupied would be a reasonable if they're not getting as much time to rent. Um, and then that looks like something. I think by the okay. nature of, of living mm -hmm. property, you don't have to rent as much as if you're not living in the property. Mm -hmm. A family come going away, <coughs> and all the reasons why if you live in the property, you're just not going to rent as much. Yeah, but the fees are not for how many times you're you're renting it. It's what it costs us to administer the program and what it costs for us to administer the program for unoccupied and occupied and then what they get out of the program. And so if we have a limit, like Stephen and Flora said, they're going from being able to rent it 365 times a year to going to 180. If we're saying everyone's going to only rent at 180, then they're not able to get as much income as they were before. So Most of our people are just renting out a portion of this. They're not renting out the whole thing. It depends. We have people building ADUs right now for the purpose of renting short term rental. All right, but there's still they have fewer bedrooms available to them yeah. than some yeah. of this non owner occupied. The majority of our owner occupied units are one to four bedrooms, the majority of our non owner occupied or five to eight bedrooms, or five to eight occupants, sorry, not bedrooms. So then these fees would still, with 180 days, still allow for a significant amount of profit. Yes. If you're only, if you're only charging $150 a night at 180 days, it's 27000 a year. And most people are charging much more than that. Yeah. So there still is the opportunity to make Was that dollar one fifteen? One eleven. The thirty thousand for the software. So yeah, off the top of my head, it was some thirty around thirty for the software, around two six thousand for staffing, um, and then around forty thousand for uh, potential lawyer fees, mm -hmm. and then a couple thousand for things like. Um, Mailings and, and notices and stuff like that. So that's where the 145 came from. Um, so right now we're saying at 111, which is um, about a quarter less than what the plan commission recommended was needed um, beyond adding some extra work to the workload in the sense of having that app at 180 um, and trying to find ways to either enforce it. Um, or at least have more justification when someone submits a permit. So we're not covering our net at, at 30 owner occupied. The, with the, with the, was estimated by the planning commission, correct? Yes. So we're about $30,000 short. Uh, well, I have, I have like the breakdown of the current breakdown and less about the averages, but this, can you scroll down there, sorry? Yeah. Oh, 700. Sorry, I have my original shit. But if we're going to get, there's going to be litigation, it's going to happen. Yeah. Uh, I mean, litigation can happen at any point, at any time. But as I'm finding out, unfortunately, way too often. Um, no, um, but it, you know, uh, I don't have the numbers in front of me, but my assumption is more legal action happens in the beginning than five years down the road. That 111 looks a little low. Yeah, it seems a little bit. Yeah. I mean, I don't, I don't want the burden of any of this to fall on the taxpayer. Yeah. But I don't need to be in the business of subsidy. No, we've already been doing this. Yeah. But the permit fees originally were a wider range. The yeah, Planning Commission's recommendations were yeah, more I mean, It was $2,500 difference, which is. You know, you're only talking twice as much there. So why can't why can't the not non owner occupied be a thousand dollars? It can be. It can be. Yeah. I mean, I'm just saying, you know, if you look at what the base registration fees were before it's seven fifty three thousand. Mm -hmm. And now we're just doubling it instead of yeah, I and mean, we'd want to run all of this stuff by our attorneys and get feedback on everything we do. Um, but again, we want to make sure that, again, like Stephen said, that one of the points getting more options to rent, and now we're 
we have limited the amount the they can rent. But so the maintenance for them is decreases from maybe have to maintenance deal with them 365 times a year to now 180 times out of the year. But if that's 700, we would have bucks. It's going to be. But didn't right. owner occupied in the village still have a limit? So, I mean, we yes, still had limits on, you know, we still. Mm, that last. <laughs> but it, it does, you know, I don't think you can just be saying, well, we're expanding what non owner occupied mm -hmm. can do. We're also expanding what, what a fair amount of. So that that's the case to raise the permit fees for owner occupied then to higher, right? Because you're saying we're doing you know, the more than the fee should be higher on that end too. So based on what we currently have projected for permitting, again, because I have the actual number of occupants, I'm getting closer to. Hold on, just double check. I'm getting closer to 140 based on the distribution of what we currently have. If that makes sense. So instead of an average of multiple units, we currently have and like the number of occupants. If that makes sense. So 140 is closer. Again, that assumes that everybody is going to. <laughs> and well, what's a what's a permanent fee here on that one? Is it 350 and a thousand? Yeah, so right. I put that in. 350, 1,000, and then. You could obviously bring rates down to actual. 250, from 1 to 4, 1,000, 5 to 8, 2,000, 9 plus. Do you understand what I'm saying? Instead of you having the averages. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I get you. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so. Oh, sir. Yeah. So again, we're, I think we're always talking about a range, not an exact number, because again, we don't know. All this stuff. So what I'm hearing right now is um, a 55-55 cap, um, a limit to 180 thousand dollars, 180 nights a year. Um, the fee structure that is currently in front on the screen, um, the permit fee for 350 for unoccupied, 1,000 for non unoccupied, and then the ox fee rates on the side: 250, one through four, 1,000, five to eight, 2,000. Um, nine plus, um, and this will go for all short term rentals throughout the town and village, including R5, um, and nothing else added or touched to the ordinance as currently presented to you last week. Do you want to revisit the waiver for pre existing legal non conformance? Because we that's in the ordinance, right? We now. decrease the fees, right? Yeah, no. so right now, what is it? How many are? But how many? Um, minus I think the waiver is for up to 2,000 if they're able to prove pre existing. It is 2,000 minus the 250. Minus the 250 non refundable application fee. So um, they're owner occupied. Mm -hmm. So we can make the waiver. They also don't count towards the limit, so none of these calculations factor them in right now. I'd have to double check my math with Ben and Steven, but we could do a. A waiver of 1000. OK, the. Uh, that would just be for the first year. We don't have a sunset on it right now, okay. but that's another consideration this board can take is if they want to sunset it. Okay, so everything I said previously with um, the waiver for uh, pre existing. Yada, yada. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, moving from 2000 to 1000. How does the board feel about that? What's the estimate? How many of those houses are there? We have. Steven, do you want to? Just owner occupied? Yeah, that, that, are, that would qualify that for that. That would qualify yeah. for what we're talking about. Currently, in the proposed ordinance, that waiver only applies to owner occupied. I would recommend. How many of those? Seven owner occupied and about 13 non owner occupied. 
so. there will likely be we're anticipating up to between five and ten that we don't know about coming forward um but those could have also moved on uh the ones that we do know about it's about a seven seven owner occupied 13 not owner occupied um who we believe would likely qualify um under the under the ordinance so, uh, in terms of people that register as a b and uh no no that's a separate, don't separate. Have a separate. Yep. Don't have some yeah forward in the last order and some of it weren't they weren't made to so we don't have a centralized idea of who they are and the rebate money comes from the funds that are earned through the fees right where does the rebate, yeah, yeah. Where, how do you rebate this it's a waiver. Uh, yeah, we we waiver up front rather than a rather than a. So that that means that it comes out of that cap, or is that cap not exist? No, we purpose we purposely because we didn't create them under the cap uh, for the fifty five fifty five. We also didn't calculate that into how much the fee generation. Oh, um, so, so the waiver is for only owner occupied, correct? Under the current, as the planning commission proposed it, yes. Okay. Um, my recommendation would be either either have it for both or don't have it. Um, so that could be up to 12, 15 that you think might apply to 20. Yeah, I would say 20 that we that we relatively believe would qualify under under the ordinance. They have to meet the burden of proof that they've been a legal non conforming okay. use. So that's a possibility of $20,000. That we're losing out on. That we're losing yeah. out. I think the $1,000 could be less, though. You're talking $2,000. We're not even charging that now. I mean, right. we've lowered the fees right. enough that. So we can get rid of it. I think the yeah. fees are low enough now. Just, yeah. Yeah. just get rid of it. Yeah. yeah. Okay. But how long would that Okay, so uh, we have uh, 55, 55, uh, 180 total um, per year. Uh, with the fee structure at 350 to 1,000 uh, split, and then um, 250 went to 4, 1,000, 4 to 8, 2,009 plus. Um, no other stuff. Um, is that kind of everyone okay with? I know there's going to be a lot of people that are going to be upset with the R5 change. And I think that we should publicize this. So, I on the listserv or the newspaper or on our so website. So what, what we'll do is... Uh, we have, don't we have another he public hearing yeah, so, once it's... So for you first, the planning and zoning uh, and myself will update the ordinance with these. We'll run it by attorney for feedback and if everything is all good. Um, we can schedule me in tonight for vote on the ordinance. Um, so I'll get back in time for our attorney and we can have it ready, post it, all that stuff. Uh, then the ordinance will have public comment and conversation, and then we'll decide which we should add uh, once we know what's going to be done. As far as simplicity goes, I think we should um, eliminate uh, the 180 days and just make it sort of across the board originally, which was that you could rent as much as you wanted um, because it seemed like there's really not, there's no way to track it uh, through the monitoring system or the, or the uh, computer program. There's no way to monitor it. And after that, it sounds like it's really not very, there's really no way that we're going to be able to force it. I think the rest of us are in agreement that 180 days sounds good. And for Stephen's testimony, he can figure out ways of figuring out how it's enforced. It's just not how it's recommended by the Planning Commission. It's gonna take different mechanisms and probably be more onerous on the owners. Yeah, That's my take. There's gonna be a lot of people that are gonna be upset. Um, yeah, I mean. It was the first time we tried to run it, but it happened, so. <laughs> um, Okay. okay, so Brenda brought up getting rid of their total. Is anyone else in favor of that, or is anyone else in favor of keeping the total 180 per year? 
I'd like to keep it. I'd like to keep the 180. Yeah, so the ordinance will reflect that uh, we put together. Um, do we want to schedule a tentative meeting uh, for next week? <laughs> So currently I'm showing no meeting on next Tuesday the 30th. Did we, t oh, we, tend we used to have something. How long Wednesday. do we think we have to have a, the meeting? I mean, isn't uh, it just it, it depends on how long the boards want public comment from discussion. So in these days, we limited public conversation to 10 minutes with the mm -hmm. assumption that these were made for the board's discussion and come to some conclusion, which we, I think we kind of have. Um, the other meeting, I think, typically with the ordinance, we can move off of a little more public comment because it is something that's going to go into effect and we vote it on afterwards. Um, I think the limit to a reasonable amount or limit a, a per person's comment to a uh, original uh, or not with this will be the public's last time to talk about it before votes happen. So I think we should give them some time to express their support or their questions or concerns. Does Tuesday give enough time to get it back from the attorney? Yeah, it should because he's already reviewed it once, um, if not twice. So he'll uh, be familiar with it. So it'll just be the changes we present. Um, they've gone through the language. They're already they're well familiar with it. So just making sure that these new changes don't throw any red flags up. Five o'clock. Are there other meetings that night? As of right now, I have nothing scheduled. Um, <laughs> Nikki, are you there still? <laughs> Sorry. It's like mercy alarm. <laughs> uh, I'll confirm, but I, I showed nothing. Um, yeah, sorry, I guess I didn't unmute, but yes, I am here. And uh, I don't have anything scheduled for that uh, yeah. night. So Tuesday the 30th. What time? What time works for the board? I mean, I think for us, the earliest, the better. So I, mean, I would love five. About four thirty. Yeah. No, five. Yeah. No. No. <laughs> Some of us are not rich. Uh, so, sorry, five or 5.30? Mm -hmm. five, 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 five o'clock. Okay, so we'll can we set that up, uh, barring any issues on our end. Um, we will be back here on Tuesday at 5 with um, a short term rental in front of the boys for a uh, discussion about. Okay. Uh, is there any other business to come before the trustees? Motion to adjourn. Okay. Uh, is there a second? Second. All in favor, <laughs> say aye. <laughs> we didn't even get it out of my mouth. Second. Aye. All those in favor? Aye. 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 That was quick. Yeah. In front. <laughs> he said second, so fast. I couldn't even say it. <laughs> <laughs>